So let me start this morning by sharing some of our findings with you. But before I do this, just a few words about the PISA assessment itself. Uh, every three years, we collect data from about half a million 15-year-olds who are randomly selected in among the countries taking part. They take a test, and what makes this test special and different from any national test is that we are not primarily concerned is with whether students can just reproduce what they learn in school. Our main interest is actually to see to what extent students can extrapolate from what they know and creatively use and apply what they have learned, often in unfamiliar situations and contexts. We also collect a lot of data from students on their background, on their learning strategies, approaches to learning, and we collect data from parents, from principals, from teachers to get a good picture of the context in which students learn, teachers teach, and school systems operate. So that gives us a quite comprehensive information base. Here you just see the countries that took part in the latest PISA assessment in gray, the countries of the OECD, including Japan, and in blue, some other countries that have joined the assessment. Some are still very patchy. You can see, for example, in the case of China, these are just four provinces so far. In the case of India, only two states. For some countries, the information base is still very kind of partial. But you can see, over time, PISA has actually <coughs> covered an increasing range of countries. Now, science learning is our focus today. And the first time that we actually assessed science learning was in the year 2006. 2006 is a long time ago for many of us. One part on which you can remember it is actually that 2006 was the year before the iPhone was invented. We didn't have smartphones in 2006. It's very hard to imagine today, but that was basically the time that has elapsed. Twitter was still a sound. The Amazon was still a river. Now we have many of the technological developments that we take for granted today did not exist in the year 2006 when we did our first science test in PISA. But you can also see that on average in the industrialized world, science learning outcomes did not change very much. Students learned more things. Science content expanded. But when you think about you know, science reasoning skills, the capacity of students to think like a scientist, we've seen actually very little change. And the world continued to develop. You know, maps became dynamic, cars became electric, and sometimes driving with, without a driver. Uh, crowdsourcing it may, it allows us to do amazing things as individuals. So. But again, even between 2006, 2009 and 2012, in terms of the quality of science learning, we saw very little change. And just think about the last three years, uh, what happened. You know, if you think about 3D printing, Allows, uh, allowing us to produce right where we are, virtual reality, bringing the world's most advanced knowledge in real time into what we do. And that highlights again that the world no longer rewards us just for what we know. It rewards us for what we can do with what we know. Think about biogenetics. No? Uh, all of those kinds of developments, big data, cloud computing, huge changes, but we have not seen much change in the context of students learning in science. Of course, you know, some countries show us actually you can improve. Portugal is an impressive country where you can see they started very low in 2006 and every three years they were actually able to improve their outcomes up to the point that they make it now above the OECD average. Or you can see Singapore moving from good to great. And of course, Japan has always been a very strong performer in the PISA context. In fact, Japan is the only large economy that has consistently produced very good learning outcomes. But the point I'm making is that our world is changing much faster than the learning outcomes in school. The environment, what students need to be able to do in science today, is changing so much faster than actually our capacity to advance in school. And that is why it is so important for us to work together to think about how we can advance science teaching and learning. You can basically now see all of this in a, in a summary slide. We can line up countries in terms of the quality of the learning outcomes. And you can see here <coughs> many countries in 
East Asia among the top performers, but some Europeans as well. Uh, Finland, the Netherlands, Switzerland are good examples. You also have Canada in North America. So we do see educational success almost around the world. No, this is not something that any geographic area has a monopoly on. No, educational success is possible in many contexts. But we also see that age at, age, at age 15, there's a huge variability in the quality of learning outcomes. And I want to add a second dimension to this, which I think is also very important, and that's the capacity of education to produce good results for students from all social backgrounds. Everybody wants to be in the upper right quarter, where performance is very strong, and all students succeed. Nobody likes to be in the lower left corner, where performance is poor, and there are large social disparities. Some believe, well, if you want to achieve well, you can only achieve well for some you know, quality at the expense of equity. And others believe if you focus on equity, you just have to accept overall mediocre results. But the interesting finding from PISA is that there is no obvious trade-off between quality and equity. In fact, Japan is a great example of a country that is capable of delivering good outcomes for students from all social backgrounds. One of the most important findings from PISA is that we can actually achieve excellence throughout the education system. Here's another <coughs> perspective that I want to just highlight very briefly, and that comes to the top performing students. When you look actually at the global talent pool among 15-year-olds, and that's a good predictor of how the world of tomorrow will look in terms of you know, science excellence. You can see the United States occupying a big part of that share. No? Not because the United States has a lot of scientific excellence. In fact, it's just doing so-so. Only 8.5% of students do really well. But because the United States is a big country. If you look at the four provinces from China that took part, no? Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Guangzhou, you can actually see that the density of excellence in science is much higher than in the United States. The likelihood that you meet high-performing students in China, at least in the four provinces, is much higher than in the United States. So they make up a big part of that pie as well. And then you take Japan. Here you get even higher in terms of the density of scientific excellence. Japan is doing extremely well in developing the top end of the performance distribution. Then comes Germany, relatively small country, sort of so-so in terms of its excellence. And the rest of the countries do not contribute very much to the global talent pool, either because they're small in size or because they're not doing well in educating students at really high levels. So that gives you a sort of a picture of how tomorrow's you know, inventions, innovations could potentially look at. But I want to add another perspective, and that looks less positive for many countries. <clears throat> we ask students also what they want to do with their lives. You know, to what extent they are not only doing well on the scientists, but to what extent they actually want to become scientists. Has school succeeded to instill the motivation among people to actually do something with science in their lives? And you can see that varies hugely across countries. And some of the countries that do quite well on the PISA science test, including Japan, including China, including Finland, including Germany, all of those education systems do well in terms of teaching science. But the 15-year-olds don't want to become scientists. So something is going wrong. You contrast this with the United States, actually, I showed you before, they're not doing very well in terms of science learning outcomes, but all of the children want to become scientists. You look at this and you ask yourselves, well, maybe we have to make a choice. You know, we either educate children well or they like the subject. But if you actually look in this in more detail, you see the choice is not so clear. Let me put the countries that do well in science in the red circle. The countries where students believe in science as a method of inquiry, in the purple one, and then in blue, the countries where students want to become scientists. And now you ask yourself, you know, can we combine this? Can we get in the center of the picture? And the answer is there is a fair number of countries that are actually very successful in doing this. Singapore, we're going to hear more of this today. Students do well on science, they believe in science, 
and they want to become scientists. Canada, and at some lower levels of performance, Slovenia, Australia, UK, Ireland, Portugal. So that shows us that you know, strong cognitive outcomes do not need to be in opposition to the kind of social and emotional dispositions that actually are important for actually mobilizing students. You can see countries like Hong Kong, New Zealand, Denmark, Chinese Taipei as a system. You can see they do well in science. Students believe in science, but also there, students don't want to become scientists. And then you have a whole list of countries, including Japan, that are doing really well in academic outcomes, but where the social and emotional dispositions are not so strong. And you have countries like the United States, Spain, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, where students believe in science, they want to become scientists, but school doesn't prepare themselves for that. And of course you find countries in the remaining quadrants as well. But again, the point I want to make here is that we should not give up on the importance of instilling high expectations among students for good academic outcomes. Now, the question of course is what links those two elements? And one of those linking factors has something to do with enjoyment in science. What you can see on this chart here is that actually you have, when, when students do better in science on the horizontal axis, they do a little bit better in career expectations among those who do not enjoy science. When students enjoy science, you can see the link becomes much, much stronger. When students enjoy science, you can see that you know, cognitive outcomes and the dispositions towards science are aligned. When students don't like science, you can do really well on the science test, but you still don't want to become a scientist. It tells us, I think it's an important message for schools and teachers that we need to actually take you know, those kinds of effective dimensions serious. Enjoyment of science is a very important predictor for the link between cognitive outcomes and those. And we actually know what is behind this. When you look at actually what drives students' career expectations, it has to do with science-specific resources at school. Well, that's what you imagine. It has to do with science activities, you know, science clubs, schools offering. It has to do with the time that we devote to science learning. No surprise as well. But it also has a lot to do with teaching strategies. You can see, for example, where teachers receive, where students get good feedback from their teachers where there is a lot of adaptive instruction, you know, teachers being capable to understand that students learn differently, and maybe in different situations, inquiry-based instruction, teacher-directed instruction, clear and structured lessons, you know, where students feel that their teachers support them. All of those factors actually are very important predictors for our career expectations among students. One more <coughs> dimension on this, and that's the student <coughs> sense of belonging in school. We also ask the students to what extent, you know, the school is a place where they feel they belong. It's the kind of environment that makes them feel at home, confident, and so on. And you can see huge variability among countries as well. It's an area where Japan does just so-so, no? an area which could be strengthened as well. And it's also an important outcome in itself. <clears throat> and finally, we ask students to what extent they're happy with their lives, satisfied with their lives. And you can see there's a lot of variability among students on this as well. And you can see actually some of the countries that do quite well on the PISA test have outcomes that are not so strong when it relates to life satisfaction, including some of this may be cultural dispositions, the way students respond to the questions. But interestingly, it's not related strictly to performance. Now you have, for example, countries like Finland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, or Estonia. Very high performing education systems where students at the very same time are also happy with their lives. So, you know, studying hard, doing well, doesn't mean that students have to be unhappy. There are countries that are actually quite good in aligning students' life satisfaction with academic outcomes. We also see that in some countries there's a significant share of young people who are unhappy with their lives, deeply unhappy at age 15. And we know what is related to this. When you think about the factors that actually predict life satisfaction, number one, teacher support. 
the students feel support, individual support by their teacher, their teacher understands them, they are not only doing better in science, they're also more happy with their lives. You can see good parental support is important. Where parents have high expectations, where parents care, where parents ask their students how was school, those things all predicted better outcomes. Socializing with friends, also more <coughs> physical activities. No? Where students had more opportunity for physical activities, you could see actually better life satisfaction. And we also know what makes students unhappy. Anxiety with schoolwork, I'm going to come back to this, and also very high internet use. Those things were actually negatively related to life satisfaction. <clears throat> Again, an important outcome, one thing that we should not you know, forget when you look at learning outcomes. And here again, you can see sort of life satisfaction and student performance together. And the point that I already made is that there's no strict relationship among them. You can see countries like Finland, the Netherlands, Switzerland and Estonia doing really, really well. There are also some countries where students do not do well in science, and that doesn't mean that they are happy. Actually, you can see there are sort of both. And then <coughs> Japan in the corner, sort of the challenge for Japan is not to move to the right side. Japan is already doing extremely well, but to move upwards towards the countries where students also have strong or effective outcomes. So the question, of course, is what can we do about this? What have we learned from PISA? That's our challenge for today. And I want to highlight the learning outcomes by their relative importance yeah, for student success. But we also need to take into account the kind of economic and social costs often attributed to change. Everybody wants to do things that are easy to do and very important. Nobody likes to invest resources into things that may not be so important, but are very expensive, very difficult to do. Some things are really, really hard to do, but very important. I'm going to focus much of my presentation on this yellow quadrant. And there are some things that may be not so important, but actually easy to do. The low-hanging fruits, and I'm going to talk about them as well. Now, how do we fill that with actually evidence? I want to lead you through a number of factors that we found really important on the PISA assessment. The first I want to start with is one where Japan does particularly well. That is a strong commitment to education. Except for public spending on education, Japan does high on virtually every dimension that relates to the commitment to education. When you ask teachers, when you ask students, when you ask parents, all value education highly. Also, students in Japan, when we ask them, you know, what makes you successful in education, they understand that it's hard work, not talent. Very different from the Western counterparts, where often students believe well, success in education has only to do with, you know, the family I come from or the school I go to. Japanese students generally understand that investing in effort actually makes a difference. And that is a very important predictor for our success. Japanese parents really worry about student success and so on. And also what Japan has is a highly homogeneous education system with very little stratification. That's very little social stratification. So I think this is an area where Japan does really, really well. And you can see in all countries for which we have comparative data, it is a great predictor for learning outcomes. In this case, I show you one dimension that is students self effect You see the extent to which they believe they own their success, as opposed to you know, just being talented. And you can see it's a good predictor, and it's a particularly strong predictor for the highest performing students. Very, very important. The second factor I want to highlight is to invest resources where they can make most of a difference. You might think that's a natural phenomenon. We always invest and redouble our effort where students face the greatest challenge. But the reality is it's not so clear. We can, for example, see when you look at for inequality and opportunity at the resources, you can see money alone is not enough. On the horizontal axis, I show you the spending per student from the age of 6 to 15. On the vertical axis, science learning outcomes. You can see if you are a low spending country, a poor country, you can see money makes a big difference. But for a country like Japan, you have to think much harder in how you actually invest your resources, how you prioritize the quality of teaching, the quality of learning. And one way in which this is articulated is the extent to which success in education relates to <coughs> spending patterns. 
On this chart, I show you not how much countries invest in education, but I show you how the investment is aligned with the challenges. If you are in the green area, it means you are investing better education resources for students in greater need. You have the, and that's the blue kind of symbols. <clears throat> or you attract the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms. That's the red symbol. If you're in the red area, it means actually we are giving the poorer students also the poorer educational environments, the less qualified teachers, the poorer educational resources. If you're in the red area, basically it means that our resources amplify social disadvantage. If you're in the green area, it means that our resource allocations moderate the impact of social disadvantage. And what we can see actually is that there are very, very few countries that actually today are in this green area. In most countries, particularly when it comes to the quality of teachers, actually often if you come from a poorer background, you also go to a school with the less qualified teachers. <coughs> now, Japan is an interesting case. You can say when it comes to the quality of science resources, they generally tend to be poorer for more disadvantaged schools and areas. When it comes to the quality of teachers, we cannot see that distinction. So at least the system is neutral. To this. Now, different from most other education systems, Japan is quite good in mobilizing and allocating its teaching resources to ensure that teaching resources are equitably distributed. In most other countries, the red diamond is deeply in the red area, which is teaching resources, allocation, amplifying social disadvantage. But again, even for Japan, getting into the green area is still a long way. Most education systems can become better in matching resources with needs. And we actually also have seen some of the data that relate to this. For example, when you see the material for hands-on activities in science is in good shape. Compared to other departments, our school science department is well equipped. Now, all of those factors are very, very important. Now, they predict better learning outcomes. But you can see when you do that before accounting for a school's socioeconomic background, the effects are much larger. Again, this illustrates often not, and it's, it's true for Japan as well. Often, if you come and live in a disadvantaged district, they are not yet good enough to ensuring that the quality of resources is really adequate. Let me come to the third factor, and that's the hardest part. That's why I make it very much to the left. And that's about the quality of learning. One thing is clear, you know, the quality of education can never exceed the quality of teachers and teaching. So paying adequate attention to good science learning is very, very important. It has to do with attracting, developing, retaining effective teachers. It has to do with instructional leadership. Now, how do school principals take responsibility to develop you know, effective teachers, building the kind of professional learning communities that change learning outcomes? It has to do with keeping teaching attractive and with this, I don't just mean financially attractive, like giving teachers good salaries and good working conditions. I also mean keeping teaching intellectually attractive, giving teachers opportunities to grow in their careers, <coughs> to actually participate in the evolution of science, to be part of the environment. And this is something where most education systems can and need to be do much better. Also on the material conditions. When you look at our PISA data, you can see that Japanese teachers work very, very long hours. That's a high level of commitment on teachers. Teacher pay used to be really good. Now it's so, so. So even on the material conditions, those things are very, very important. And career development, now giving teachers good opportunities to invest in their own careers and in the careers of their colleagues, those things are really, really important. Let's have a look at some data on this. The first thing is about quantity. On the vertical axis, I show you the student-teacher ratio. No. How many teachers uh, is a country investing per every 100 students? On the horizontal axis, I show you the class size. And now you might say, well, the class size and the student-staff ratio should be more or less related. But you look at this across countries and you can see there's almost no relationship. Look at this. You compare the United States with China. 
both have quite a similar student-staff ratio, quite favorable. The plenty of teachers invested for every 100 students. But the class size in China is so much larger than in the United States. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? It's just a way of differently spending their resources. If you're a teacher in the United States, no, you have very little time for other things than teaching. Your teaching load is excessively high, one of the highest in the world. That's the price that the Americans pay for relatively small classes and an average student-staff ratio. In the case of China, you go to the highest performing province, Shanghai, in China, you teach between 11 and 16 hours per week. Actually, a lot less than even in Japan. But you actually work a similar number of hours than teachers in Japan. And that means actually teachers have a lot more time to do other things than teach. They observe other teachers' classrooms, they participate in professional development activities, they are part of professional learning communities, they're working with individual students, they're working with parents. So you have very different models of work organization. The student-staff ratio is just the overall resource. You can invest this very, very differently. You look at Japan, it sort of comes out between those two countries. Relatively favorable student-staff ratio, moderate class size, again means that teachers have a lot of other responsibilities. And you add to this the willingness of your teachers to invest a high number of hours, and that also gives them plenty of opportunities to do things like you know, science clubs, science learning activities, lots of things other, uh, outside the classroom. And that is very important. Our actually data suggests that these things actually do make an important difference for learning outcomes. So, in some countries invest their resources in very, very different ways. <coughs> Uh, one example is professional collaboration. I already showed how important this is, and when we look at the data across countries, we can actually see when it comes to fairly informal coll collaboration, you're discussing individual students' results, sharing resources, team conferences, these things are quite common. But when you look at the kind of deeper level of professional collaboration that is most predictive for better outcomes, we can actually see it's quite rare. Team teaching, collaborative professional development, joint activities, classroom observation. Fortunately, you know, Japan is among the countries where those things are more common. But still, there's a lot more that countries can do to create an environment that bring teachers more together, that combine a high level of professional autonomy with a collaborative culture. That's the combination that we see associated with success. Why do I say this? Because our data show the more teachers teach jointly, the more they observe other teachers' classes, the more they engage in joint activities, the more they take part in professional collaboration, the greater their level of teacher efficacy. We also see the greater the level of job satisfaction, satisfaction with the work organization. Those things are really, really important, and most countries, as you could see, could do a lot better on that. I want to come back to this issue around teacher support. I mentioned already how anxiety with schoolwork is a big issue. It's also a big issue in Japan. Many of your 15-year-olds are quite worried for doing well on the next test, even if they are well prepared. And what we can actually see is that some of the factors relate to this. For example, we can see that where students <coughs> Uh, where teachers uh, adapt the lesson to my class's needs and knowledge, no? adaptive instruction, anxiety goes down. Where the teacher provides individual help when a student has difficulties understanding a task, according to the view of the student, anxiety goes down. When, teachers, when students perceive their teachers not to be fair, anxiety goes up. When, teachers, when students perceive that teachers don't understand their individual needs, anxiety goes up. And that's so interesting. You know, when we ask students, are they anxious with a test, we cannot find any relationship with the prevalence of tests. No. Japan is a country where students are not tested so much. No. Where students are worried. It's not the number of tests. It's the level of teacher support that students perceive that is actually relating to that anxiety. So creating a strong student-teacher relationship is your best bet to actually keep anxiety at moderate levels. Let me come to the last point that I really want to make, and that's basically about the instructional system in education. 
let me highlight a couple of points here, and I start with what I call the productivity puzzle in PISA. Let me tell you why this is a puzzle. You can see on the, on the vertical axis, PISA science performance. On the horizontal axis, learning time in science. Now, if I would look at Japan only, I see that the more students learn science, the more hours they have in science, they better come, they come out on the PISA test. No? And I can say that for every other country. The more science instruction we have, the better the science learning outcomes. Number of hours of instruction is always a good predictor for better outcomes. When I do that across countries, it looks like this. The more time students spend learning, the worse they come out on PISA. Now, how do you reconcile this? Within a country, the more you expand learning time, the better you come out. And across countries, there seems to be a negative relationship between the volume of learning time and learning outcomes. Well, actually, the answer is not so difficult. The answer is that the quality of learning outcomes is always the product of the quantity of learning, learning hours, and the quality of learning. And that's basically something that we have tried to measure as well. Here you see just the volume of learning outcomes in school. In yellow, I add to this learning outcomes uh, out of school. No? You go to the juku, you do homework, all of those kind of things. <clears throat> and you can see it varies hugely across countries. No? If you go, for example, to China or to the United Arab Emirates, students spend almost 60 hours in learning every week. If I go to Finland, it's almost half of that. And now you can look at the learning gains per hour of instruction. You can see how hugely that varies across countries. You can look at Finland, Germany, Switzerland, and Japan, and you can see actually with moderate learning outcomes, uh, uh, time investments, learning outcomes are very good. Japan is among the countries with the highest level of productivity. And productivity is probably very much a question of the quality of teaching. There's few hours those countries do really well. If you go to the United Arab Emirates, and I told you already, 60 hours per week, the problem is that students don't learn anything in that 60 hours. So we can see there is huge variability among countries in the impact that teaching and learning has on learning outcomes. So when you want to raise learning outcomes, yes, you can add more hours to the curriculum, and you probably get better outcomes. But you'll much, be much better off to rather focus your effort on making the black dot higher, improving the quality of learning. Finland is a great example how with few hours you can achieve excellent outcomes. And let me just sort of uh, conclude with one chart that is also very important. We looked, <coughs> particularly in a PISA 2012 assessment, very much at students' dispositions to learn. The oldest learning strategy is memorization. You know, you, your teacher teaches you something, and they ask you to reproduce it later. If you look at this across countries, actually, Japan does not emphasize memorization very much, contrary to what many people say is a stereotype of Japan. Many people say countries in East Asia are all about memorization. Actually, that used to be the true in the past. That is no longer true. In fact, that is one of the biggest changes that we have observed in the case of Japan. If we did, when we did this in the very first PISA assessment in 2000, memorization was much higher in Japan. But education, successive educational reforms since the year 2000 have actually reduced the extent to which Japanese students rely on memorization. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Actually, for example, what's also interesting, you look at countries like here, Ireland, the United Kingdom. If you ask teachers in the United Kingdom what's their favorite teaching strategy, they say, oh, we believe in a constructivist view of education. You know, we don't memorize. No? If you actually look at this among student results, the United Kingdom is one of the countries that does so much more memorization than Japan today. Some of the stereotypes that we have about education are actually put challenged when we actually collect real data on this. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? We've started to look at this. Here I basically look at the difficulties of mathematics items on the horizontal axis, 
and the extent to which memorization helps you to get them right. Where I'm going to put items in the green area, it means basically memorization is a good strategy to solve those tasks. When I put them in the red area, memorization is not so good. And you can already see by the relative size on the chart that memorization generally is not very effective. It's reasonably good among easy tasks, no? but the harder the problems get, the less memorization actually helps you to get them right. Memorization is good for easy tasks, it's actually not a good learning strategy to get the most difficult PISA task right. And that is one of the reasons why countries that heavily rely on memorization don't come so well out on PISA. Now, memorization is not the only task. Another uh, uh, learning strategy are control strategies. And control strategies are something that you as teachers and school principals can really consciously develop. This is about you know, helping students set clear learning goals, monitor their learning, basically master their learning strategies, knowing how to learn. And you can see Japan is doing really, really well on this. No? Only <coughs> you can see uh, only a few countries basically do better than this. Control strategies is something that is very important. Why do I say important? Well, when you look at the same picture before, you can actually see control strategies are a very important predictor for most of the PISA tasks. But you can also see it helps you, relatively speaking, more on the easier and middle level tasks. On the hardest problems, control strategies are not enough. To get the most difficult PISA task right, you need something else. And this is what we call elaboration strategies. That's your capacity you know, to connect previous knowledge with new knowledge, to expand, to, to think across the boundaries of subject matter disciplines, to be very active in your learning. And this is an area, the only area, that Japan is not doing so well. Elaboration strategies are not so prevalent in Japanese classroom instruction according to what students tell us about their approaches to learning. This is always a student perspective. But I believe it's a quite reliable perspective because students actually have a good sense of what actually happens in learning. And this is why the current changes that Japan is working on you know, to promote active learning. This is really what this is about. Active learning is about you know, developing better elaboration strategies. Being able to think out of the box, to use your knowledge creatively, to link what you already learned with what you are just seeing. There are actually a lot of responsibilities on students. Why is this important? And this is, for example, this is very interesting. This is the one area where Shanghai in China did so much better than Japan. When I come to memorization, you know, China and Japan are very similar. When I come to control strategies, Japan is doing even better than the case of China. But this is the area where there's a big gap between those two systems. The students in Shanghai did particularly well on those kinds of elaboration strategies. Now, why this is important, you can see that really nicely on this chart. Now, it's not a, elaboration strategies are not very helpful for getting simple tasks right. Now. But they are extremely important when you come to the most complex problems. Now. And it is the most complex problems that dominate tomorrow's learning. Now. The kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, are also easy to digitize, automate, and outsource. Now. Computers are becoming better and better every day to solve the easy tasks on the PISA test. To get students to think like a scientist, to work like a scientist, to solve complex science problems really needs great emphasis on those kinds of active learning strategies and elaboration strategies. Very, very important, and it's an area that Japan can improve. But I also want to highlight that those strategies are not very effective for easy tasks. And that also highlights that, you know, things like project-based learning, active learning strategies are very important to get students to solve complex problems. They are not very effective learning environments for simple tasks. If you try project-based learning to teach students the multiplication tables, you know, you're going to waste a lot of student learning time. The opportunity costs are high. So in sum, what this means is that the capacity of teachers to master a variety of teaching and learning strategies is very, very important. To be able to deploy the right method for the right moment. 
And when you look at this in Japan, you know, on the case of you know control strategies, things are really well. Japanese students know how to learn; they can manage their learning. When it comes to elaboration, still some important room for improvement. Just me, let me just summarize this. And actually, I think this chart doesn't really work for some reason. I'm going to skip that. Um, <clears throat> what I want to uh, highlight here is when you look at learning approaches, what, uh, what PISA shows, more teacher-directed approaches, where a teacher structures the lessons, they stand in front of the students, they basically is a more kind of controlled classroom situation very important for raising learning outcomes. But when it comes to you know, student engagement, career expectations, where Japan is not yet so strong, this is where we actually see student-oriented teaching practices particularly important. And again, it's something that I know Japan is trying hard with the new curriculum reform to strengthen that kind, to get a better balance between what is already working well in terms of learning outcomes and what can still be improved. Last point, very last point to mention is simply what is also really critical is to have good coherence in the instructional systems, to align policies across the entire spectrum from early childhood education to university, to make them coherent, to make sure that what's in the curriculum is actually being taught and done, and finally to ensure that you know teachers in the classroom are also capable of delivering this instruction. And once again, you know, Japan is a great example for educational success at scale, but you could also see there are always areas where we can improve in a very fast-changing world. Thank you very much.